Welcome to today's webinar. My name is Caitlin Croft, and I'm very excited to have Martin joining us from CSS Electronics. And he will be discussing how to store and visualize CAN bus tele telematic data with InfluxDB Cloud and Grafana. Once again, please feel free to post any questions you may have for Martin in the Q&A, and uh, we'll answer them at the end. Well, without further ado, I'm going to hand things off to Martin. Thanks, Caitlin. All right. So thanks, uh, everybody, for joining. And today, uh, we will be talking about how to, to visualize CAN bus data, um, specifically from the CAN Edge 2, and how to do it using Grafana and InfluxDB. And if some of you can see me on the video, I'll be talking a lot about this small device here, the CanH2, which is essentially our data logger with Wi-Fi, and which is the solution that we'll be discussing as part of today's session. To give you a quick overview, um, we'll be running through just a bit about CSS electronics, about CAN bus, so that you have a basic understanding if you're not already familiar with the protocol, and the CanH2. And then after that, we will run into the actual telematics dashboards, essentially why we have chosen InfluxDB and Grafana, how we implemented it. And then the cool part, which will be running through some of the actual dashboards that we have made, as well as some of, some of the cool stuff that some of our users have made using the integration. But uh, let's start with uh, CSS and myself. Uh, now I have this on top here. So I'm one of the co-owners at CSS Electronics. Um, I've been with the company for five years. And my responsibilities are somewhat broad. I'm a head of uh, sales, uh, but also helping, you can say, all of our customers and users with tech support. Besides that, I'm also responsible for our marketing. So that involves our website, videos, search engine optimization, and other things. And then a bit with my left hand, I do some uh, software development, uh, both in React, Python, Ruby, and other tools and, uh, and other languages. My background is within uh, management consulting and corporate strategy, uh, and I have a degree in financial economics, which are two things that are not uh, immediately or obviously relevant to the stuff I do today. Um, <laughs> that's how I think sometimes uh, turn out. I live in Denmark with my wife and three kids. Um, and just a bit about CSS uh, as a company, we started in 2015. And today we supply uh, 2,000 plus companies uh, globally across 80 countries. Our specialty is CAN bus hardware and specifically CAN bus data loggers. So that means recording data to an SD card. Um, but we are also branching out into additional modules as I will get into in a moment. We, uh, we do PCB layouts, so the stuff inside the devices, we do that from scratch, which is one of our specialties. All of our firmware is done in embedded C, which might be interesting to some of you. So we're not using a Linux or uh, other type of system inside. And the assembly of our products is done uh, by our US partner for many years. Uh, other than that, we have been carbon neutral since 2019 through offsets. And you can say as an overall perspective or uh, overall, our products are used particularly by automotive and industrial OEMs. So the users that we uh, cater to are engineers, and they are typically engineers in uh, research and development teams, for example, trying to diagnose new equipment that they are producing or manufacturing for, for various automotive applications. In order to, uh, to understand today's webinar, uh, I thought it would be useful just to have a very quick basic on or basic intro on what Canvas is. Uh, Canvas is a, is a network uh, it's essentially like the nervous system inside your car, but it's not just your car. It's essentially anything with wheels. And you can see it a bit in this next picture here. So pretty much anything that moves uses canvas today, whether it's within aerospace, uh, maritime, and the uh, two wheelers, four wheelers, trucks, mining, uh, forklifts, agriculture, many different things, uh, but also even down to small e scooters. Um, those are some of the typical segments that we cater to, um, but it is also widely used within industrial automation. So things like robotics and production machinery also use Canvas. I won't go uh, fully in depth on how Canvas works. Uh, you can read the small intro that we linked to in the slides here, uh, but suffice to say, 
it is an extremely uh, popular and extremely widely used protocol. And what we do is essentially to help record the Canvas data from different applications. You can, you can say the way that works is that if you take your car, for example, today, in order for your car to operate, the, the CAN bus traffic essentially helps, or the CAN bus network helps communicate traffic between different parts of the car uh, in order to facilitate communication so that the car is able to operate. But all of this traffic is usually not captured, meaning that it is used instantaneously and consumed by the different ECUs within a car, but it is not recorded in any way. It's not stored on a server, it's not stored on an SD card. And most of the time, that's obviously not necessary either. But if you want to diagnose something, if you want to monitor something from a vehicle, then you need a way to record this canvas data. And that's where we come in. To get a bit of an understanding of what this looks like, um, I've just taken one sort of deep dive into the whole canvas uh, logging aspect. And that is because I think it is important for those that are not familiar with canvas data logging to understand how it works. If you take a usual IoT device, you might be uh, thinking of a temperature sensor or a GPS sensor that monitors a specific value and sends that as a physical value, as we would call it. That could be a degree Celsius, or it could be a longitude value or a temperature of other types. Um, that's not how Canvas works by default. By default, you will record what you see on the left-hand side here on this slide, which is essentially a timestamp data with uh, identifiers and data bytes. And if you're not familiar with Canvas data, the stuff on the left side over here will look uh, like nonsense to you and you will not be able to understand it. On the right-hand side, you have what we uh, typically call physical values or decoded Canvas data. And here you have you know, stuff like engine speed, like RPM in your car, speed in kilometers per hour, fuel level and percentages, et cetera. So how do you get from here to here? That's what we illustrate by this small uh, drawing down here that you would record some raw CAN data. And then there is this uh, magic over here called a DBC file or essentially a small database. What this file does is that it tells you how to interpret the raw data over here and what it means when you're seeing a specific ID and a specific set of data bytes. So if you have a software tool that understands these two components, you're able to produce the stuff on the right-hand side, which is what we will be focusing on today. So essentially time series data. If we look at what, uh, what kind of stuff we do and, and what type of challenge uh, we solve with our products, you can take a typical situation from one of our users so you might have a, a battery OEM, a forklift battery OEM that needs to collect data from a prototype vehicle. It could be a prototype battery. Um, they may need to do so across hundreds of units and across different warehouses located in different states, for example. So that would be a typical use case. There are some uh, complications to this uh, setup. Um, first of all, one complication is that these users are not your average users, they are engineers and they have very specific requirements to what a product like this needs to be able to do. I'm not gonna run through it all of them, but essentially it relates to the state or, or the, the capabilities of the device in terms of performance and in terms of different functionalities and different configuration options. The CanEdge 2 that we deliver essentially cater to these requirements and it enables users to collect their data in the specific way that they need to do it and to do it in an automated way. So instead of installing a device in a forklift and then manually sending a technician to fetch the data on site, the CanEdge 2 is essentially able to store data from a forklift onto the SD card, as you can see over here, um, and when the CANH2 moves within range of a Wi-Fi access point, it is able to automatically offload the data from the SD card onto a server hosted by the end user. The server could be a cloud server, as we'll get a bit into, or it could be a local self-hosted server. It could even be a server hosted on a Raspberry Pi, if you want. 
And on this server, you can then manipulate and process the data in different ways, as we'll look into today in terms of dashboards, for example. I'm not going to go deep into the Canvas true, but if you want to read a bit more about how this device works and, and the functionality, there are some links in the presentation that you can run through afterwards. But just to give you the basics in terms of, you know, the understanding of how the machinery in this works, the, the first step you would do if you were to deploy a CanH2 would be to set up your own server. We use a server concept called S3, which is like a modern equivalent to FTP servers. S3 servers are used very broadly. Uh, Amazon S3 is the most common one. But there are also many other uh, cloud options like Google Cloud has a, an S3 version. And you can use self-hosted uh, servers as well, uh, like Minio S3 servers. Setting up an S3 server can sound a bit, you know, are you able to do this if you've not worked with servers before, but it's actually very easy. Once you've done this, you would then configure our device with um, your server and Wi-Fi details. So it could be a Wi-Fi router in a warehouse, or it could be a USB hotspot with a SIM card inside. When you have configured the device and you plug it into the vehicle, it will automatically start recording the data and when a new log file is created, for example, after five minutes, that log file is uploaded to your server. And once it's uploaded successfully, it's deleted from the SD card. So that's essentially how the logging process works. And on your server, you can then process the data, for example, using Python APIs, as we'll look a bit into. There are many use cases for this. So we talked about uh, warehouses as an example, but it's also very commonly used within agriculture. Like if you want to monitor uh, agricultural vehicles across a harvest season, for example, it's also used a lot within automotive um, when OEMs need to uh, basically monitor and debug uh, equipment within cars. Uh, it's also used within ships and boats in the maritime vessels. Uh, it's used a lot within heavy duty trucks and transit buses. And then it's also used within uh, industrial automation like robotics. Just a bit about what makes our solution different from some of the other solutions on the markets. We, uh, we essentially try to put ourselves in between two different markets. So a big market today is within prospects, as we call them, professional grade automotive data loggers. There are quite a few of these uh, on the market, uh, both from European and US manufacturers. They are typically uh, three to four times more expensive than our devices. So our starting point was essentially to create a mid-tier or, or lower cost alternative to these devices while still providing professional grade specs that can compete with them. More recently, a large share of our focus and, and also sales have moved into the CanH2, which adds the Wi-Fi functionality and the ability to remotely collect your data. And by doing so, we also gradually shift a bit into another segment, vehicle telematics, which is your classical, you know, having a small dongle in a truck, doing fleet management, these type of things. But we do not cater uh, typically to large fleets or aftermarket customers. We typically cater to OEMs and engineers at OEMs that need to get this type of professional data logging, but they also need a convenient way to collect it at scale. So that's a bit about a, sort of the concept. Another thing that sort of characterizes our approach is we do not charge for our software. So we're really passionate about open source solutions. Uh, personally, we, uh, we dislike it when you charge subscriptions to, uh, to a product like ours. So we try to move that um, outside of our offering. Uh, and we do so by integrating with many different open source uh, tools. And we do so by standardizing our integrations and our interfaces. And one of the perhaps last things that's important to know is as a result of these things, we also do not host anything. Uh, we do not host servers. We do not sort of have a cloud server that we collect all of our customers' data at, both because the data is typically extremely sensitive to our customers, but also because it's just not part of our concept. Um, the reason we can do this is, again, that our customers are, are quite smart and they know what they're doing. Otherwise, this would be an impossible setup. So that was a bit about CSS electronics and just, you know, what we do and how the CanH2 works. And if there are any questions at the end of the webinar on that, we can definitely run through that a bit more.
Then uh, let's talk a bit about the actual uh, InfluxDB and Grafana integration and how that works and, and why we did this. So the starting point for us when we looked into, uh, when we looked into this solution was that we had a lot of users communicate and report to us that while they liked the CanEdge, they were lacking a solution for visualizing the data in the browser. Um, and the whole concept of dashboards was typically mentioned and typically came up as you know what they were looking for. And before we uh, looked at this integration, we had various tools uh, for the CanEdge, which we still do today. Uh, we had you know, configuration editors for easily configuring your device. We have conversion tools for easily getting the log files into other formats. We have sort of standard PC tools for you know, decoding the data using the DPC files and visualizing it, as you can see down here. We also had a Python API if you wanted to automate your, your processing of the data. And then we had a browser-based tool for, uh, for managing devices and data, but not for visualizing the data. So to us, um, it felt like the browser dashboard integration would be a really nice addition um, and would supplement many of these tools really well. So we looked into, you know, how do we best create a dashboard integration for, uh, for our device? And the, the obvious challenge is, you know, how do you, or our users, they want to visualize their Canvas data in the browser and they want to create a, a classic telematics dashboard if you want. But there are, there are some uh, sort of complications to this. Uh, one of the complications that we had is that when you look at dashboards, when you look at Grafana, their typical use cases, or InfluxDB and many of, of uh, the typical use cases shown there, you're typically looking at something like server monitoring or uh, PC monitoring, figuring out if there are errors, like an IT department administration dashboard kind of tool. And what, uh, what characterizes those type of solutions is that it's often fine to have a 10 second resolution. Um, and if you're going down to five or one second resolutions, then you are pretty crazy. Um, in our case, we need uh, often to be able to visualize data and to drill down at the one millisecond resolution so that's thousand times per second and that puts you know some restrictions on how do we actually set this up how do we get performance into this and and what kind of uh, integrations would we require another thing is uh, because we do not host anything and because we do not cater to one specific use case or one specific segment of users we need to enable our users to customize their dashboards for exactly their own use case. We don't know if this is going to be used in a plane or in a ship uh, or in a car or in a truck um, or if it's going to be used in a drone or for something completely different. Each of these use cases will require different types of uh, custom dashboards. So it needs to be very easy for our users to actually do this. And if it's not easy, then we're going to drown in support. Uh, so, so the setup of this also has to be really easy. In addition, uh, because of our concept, as mentioned before, uh, we wanted something that is optionally at least 100% free and open source. At the same time, because many of our users are not just using one or two or five or 10 devices, but many of them use several hundred devices in the field, it needs to be possible to scale this solution um, in a convenient way. The solution that we found uh, to be the most sort of suitable for this, um, for this challenge here was to essentially use our Python API for processing the uh, log file data and then to write the decoded data into InfluxDB and visualize it in Grafana. And the way we do this is to provide a step-by-step -step guide and some plug and play scripts that I'll show in a moment. But before we sort of jump into how it works and how we did it, um, I think it's useful to just understand why specifically Grafana, why InfluxDB. So it doesn't have to be these two solutions. In principle, you could use our Python API to integrate with other solutions. But for us, we needed uh, something that we thought worked well as at least the, uh, the way to get started for many of our users. Grafana, uh, we chose uh, because it's a very popular tool in our opinion and in our sort of research, it's perhaps the most popular open source dashboard tool available. And you can see it a bit from the 40K GitHub stars that it has. 
Um, Grafana is a really nice and intuitive front end uh, for customizing your panels and for customizing your dashboards. It's free and open source. It has a nice optional cloud uh, starter account. So you can essentially just log in with your Google details or your mail and create account, an account uh, that is quite uh, unrestricted in the free version. Another cool thing is that Grafana has uh, hundreds of plugins, uh, including uh, GeoMap plugins, and it has easy support for variables and alerts that I'll show in a moment. So we, we originally selected Grafana and then we needed to find, you know, find Grafana as the front end, what is going to be the solution for our database, where we essentially need to store the decoded data or the physical values. And we looked at InfluxDB again, because it's popular um, and it is natively supported by Grafana and it came up in our research as one of the most popular data sources for Grafana. It's free and open source. And then importantly, InfluxDB uh, has an optional cloud, including a free starter edition. So uh, not all of the time series databases that are available has this option. And the interface we found for, for InfluxDB is really nice. Uh, so as you can probably imagine, the combination of a cloud edition of Grafana and then a cloud edition of Influx, that combination eliminates a lot of starter issues, such as firewalls and port forwarding and other things. And combining these can be done very fast. Then, uh, then we also found that it was quite easy to integrate in Python with InfluxDB, which was important for, for our use case. And it has a very nice uh, UI uh, user interface. If you log into the, uh, to the cloud, you can essentially manage things without knowing scripts or anything like that. And then while not mentioned here, one of the important things about InfluxDB is that it also supports intrasecond resolution in contrast to some of the other uh, time series databases out there. So to give you a quick idea of uh, how we actually implemented this, um, the way we took or the route we took uh, was essentially to have a article, an article that is quite high level to explain the concept and what you can do uh, and how it works. The reason this is important is that traditionally within this type of segment, the way it's usually done is that the company, the company like ours would be hosting both the database and the dashboards and users would simply be provided with a login and then they have you know the solution available and there are pros and cons to this concept but it's definitely a lot different than what we do uh, and that, therefore we need to explain that up front so users actually know what they're getting um, secondly our users they need to be able to set this up themselves they need to set up an influx db account themselves they need to set up a Grafana account themselves and they need to use the Python script and deploy that themselves. So in order for, for users not to drown in this and not to get frustrated, it is critical for our solution that the time to awesome is really small uh, or really short. So, uh, so therefore we needed to create a simple solution as the starter solution. And you can see it up here, uh, visualized a bit uh, how we uh, went around it. So we have a guide that I'll show just in a moment where we recommend users to set up, you know, uh, the free uh, cloud starter versions. So users may have, for example, an Amazon S3 server where they are uploading data to from their CanH2, but it could also be one of the other S3 server options available, like the self-hosted options. Then we recommend as the starting point that users set up an InfluxDB uh, cloud account and a Grafana uh, cloud account. With these, you can essentially then deploy the Python script that we promote and that we have created as a plug and play script. You can run that on your own PC. That will then fetch data from your Amazon cloud server or other S3 server. It will process that data to essentially get or extract the physical values, which it will then write into the InfluxDB database. And then you connect Grafana with the InfluxDB cloud which is really easy because both of them are clouds. So there is no sort of funky stuff going on. It's just very, very plug and play. And once you've done this, you are essentially ready. You will have your data available from Influx. You can start creating panels in Grafana. So really, really easy. 
and just for the sort of technical side, for those of you that are familiar a bit with InfluxDB, we essentially decided in terms of our structure that we try to use measurements uh, to them, those we set equal to our device serial number. So each Canets2 has a unique eight uh, character serial number. And then each parameter like speed or RPM or temperatures will be equal to fields within the context of an InfluxDB database. So now I'm going to jump a bit out of the presentation and just show you a bit of things from uh, how this is actually set up, uh, just to give you a better idea of, of how it works. The first thing I just want to show is essentially the guide. So within our introduction to the CanH2, uh, we essentially provide a step-by-step -step, uh, guide on how to set this up. And I'm just going to run through it really briefly to just get, give you an idea of what steps are actually involved. So the first thing, as we discussed, is to set up an InfluxDB account and get the credentials. And as you can see in our guide, what we try to do in order to make this easy for users is to you know, visualize its show with videos and GIFs and the like. Where do you actually get each of the details? And then show examples of each of the details you need, like a bucket, token, organization ID, and the endpoint for your Influx database. And then you set up a Grafana account and you link it to your InfluxDB database. And again, we try to visualize how you do it, uh, but uh, I would say that part is really simple. We, uh, we recommend users to start with the cloud editions, but if they want to self-host everything using Docker, for example, we also have a small guide for how you would do that uh, inside uh, the guide here. But assuming you have you know, the cloud account set up, the next step would be to, uh, to actually start writing data using our Python script into InfluxDB. And uh, what we promote here, or what we provide here for our users is a script that is designed to be plug and play. So if you do not know Python, you do not have to know it in order to, to actually uh, use this tool. Uh, it's an advantage, I would say, to have worked with some type of coding in the past, in particular, if you want to do more advanced stuff. But in principle, you can follow the guide in here, install Python, download the script along with our sample data, and then you can actually use that sample data to write uh, some parameters into InfluxDB without having a CanH2. And that is important for us because we typically refer users to try this out before they decide whether they want to buy a CanH2, because if they don't like the whole setup uh, of how it works, then you know, it's better for everybody uh, that, uh, that you do not buy the device at all. Once you've uh, set up the script and you set it to, uh, to run the first time, then uh, the next step that you would typically want to do is to automate it. So let's imagine now that instead of using our sample data, you have set up the script uh, using some of the, uh, the input variables so that it fetches data from your own server and it writes uh, data to, to your Influx uh, DB account. Now you could, could uh, want to automate it, which you can do in many ways. Uh, let's say you're running it on your PC, you could use something as basic as Windows Task Scheduler to run the script on a periodic basis so that every half hour it checks your server for new log files that have not been processed before and it writes the data from those into InfluxDB. An alternative way that some of our users also do is that they use event triggers. So for example, if you have an Amazon cloud server, you can use something called AVS Lambda to trigger a script execution every time a new log file is uploaded. So it depends a bit on your preference and, and what type of scale you're running this at, uh, what you prefer, uh, but there are different options we describe in here. Once you've done this automation, you should, should essentially start having data run into your InfluxDB instance, and you can then you know, uh, customize and set up your Grafana dashboard. And we provide a bit of tips and, uh, and tricks in here, uh, and Grafana also has a good tutorial on getting started with this. So what we try to do is to essentially provide users with some plug and play uh, curry examples so uh, that it's easy for them to get started. You know, if you just want to visualize one variable or as in this case here, two variables, how do you do that? Um, so here we hard code these and we also hard code the serial number of the device that you're showing this for. So I'll show a bit of variations on this in a moment. Those of you familiar with Influx uh, will know that this is the Flux query language, which we selected basically based on some research and because it seems like Flux uh, is the one or the newest uh, of the Influx languages, 
and hence we wanted to use something that would most likely be the more long-term uh, supported one. But I'm sure Caitlin can comment on that in the end, um, what, uh, what might be relevant here. So this is essentially the guide. And, uh, and as you can probably imagine, you know, one thing is uh, going through a bit of a dry guide like this. Uh, so it might be interesting to some of you how we actually try to promote this um, so you can see you know, what you're getting uh, from this. And what we do a lot on, uh, on our website is we try to make it very visual and very sort of easy to, to see uh, how do the tools work, how does the software work. So we have this uh, small overview here. And when it comes to the dashboards, we actually have a, a playground that you can jump into. So this is a public playground and you can go in and you can actually uh, play around with it and see how it works. So as an example here, uh, we have a playground that shows some data uh, from a truck. So this is data, or this data is called J1939. It's a variation of CAN bus data that is used within heavy duty vehicles like trucks and buses and other, other applications. The way it works in here is essentially that, uh, that you create these panels. So if I wanted to create a new one, I could do this. And within this panel here, you would put in a, a piece of, a, of code and if we just jump back into the, uh, the example from before here, uh, you could essentially take this. Let's see if it works. Yeah, it actually worked. So you can see that what we're doing here is essentially to fetch data from a specific device. And we are fetching uh, two uh, parameters here, RPM and wheel-based vehicle speed. And when I save this query in here, it's essentially fetching this stuff from InfluxDB and visualizing it up here. So if you're familiar with Grafana, there's not a lot of hocus pocus uh, here, but if you're not, I think it's useful to just uh, jump into the playground after this webinar and try and play around with it. You can do a lot of cool stuff in terms of uh, visualization and how you want to, to show things uh, in here, uh, both in terms of the visual um, presentation of the panels, but also in terms of, uh, of different options for the queries here. To give you an example, uh, some of the stuff, just gonna delete this here. But some of the stuff we, uh, we found really, really important for, for our type of use case was the ability to uh, enable users to have some level of control over the dashboards. So it's one thing to show you know, a static dashboard with uh, certain parameters that somebody who created this dashboard decided to show. But it's nice to be able to, uh, to have the uh, capability uh, in a live way and, and from your browser to show other parameters. And that's what you can do uh, with uh, the, uh, the Flux query language as well. Essentially, what you can see down here is that we, uh, we are specifying in some of these panels that instead of taking a specific predefined device, it should fetch the device or the multiple devices selected up here from a dropdown. And instead of selecting a specific predefined parameter, um, it should select you know, the parameters that I select from this drop down here and then show those. Um, so that's what it's saying down here. And this career example is of course also shown in our guide. And it's a nice way to allow any front end user of this dashboard in their own session here to make changes and, uh, and to visualize different data. Of course, you can also you know, quickly uh, jump in and out in terms of the, uh, the time range so if I wanted to zoom in on something, I can easily do that. Um, and I'm gonna show an example of why that can be extra important in a moment. Another thing that was useful for us uh, with Grafana is a, a plugin called TrackMap. That's what you're seeing over on the left-hand side. So when I'm actually scrolling through our data here, you can see that the GPS position on the map is changing as well. That means that I'm actually able to see what is a specific parameter value at a specific point in time. And that's often useful if you're doing diagnostics or you're doing other type of analysis of automotive equipment, you know, where was the vehicle when this occurred uh, at a specific event, for example. Another nice thing about Grafana and also InfluxDB, I would say, is the ability to set up alerts. So you can essentially say that you want an alert if a specific event occurs like for example, vehicle speed uh, going above a certain level. And again, here you could be creative. It could be based on calculated signals that you specify in Python in a specific way. You can do essentially whatever you want with these alerts. Uh, the key thing is that it's easy to set up and you can get your alert notifications via text or via email or via Slack notifications or other things. 
So that's a bit of you know an example of a dashboard we used in a, in the J1939 or in the heavy duty case. And if you go into the playground, you can actually find all of our dashboards by clicking over here and go to the manage section. One of the other cases I'm just going to quickly show is here from a car. What is cool about this case is that uh, we're actually using one of our new products, uh, a GPS module, which you can combine with our CanEdge uh, in order to add a GPS data to whatever data you're recording. So uh, what that looks like is essentially down here. I'm just going to show you quickly. So you're essentially combining the CanEdge 2 with a module, and it could look like uh, what you're seeing in this picture here, where the module is pushing data into the CanEdge through uh, one of the channels. And at the same time, the CanEdge is recording data from a car through the first channel here. The combination of this data allows you to show things like, for example, what is the fuel level in the car? That's based on the car's data uh, through something called OBD2. But you're also able to see things like the GPS position. And again, the cool thing is you can monitor how these variables are changing over time. So if you want to see, for example, has there been a period with a specific fuel uh, consumption, you could show things like that. And you can also uh, show, you can say, data around your dynamic uh, vehicle behavior. So beyond GPS data, the module here also provides different um, accelerometer and gyroscope data so that you can see accelerations, whether you are driving over a road bump, uh, if you're doing harsh braking, that kind of stuff. Just to give you a bit of an idea of you know, what type of applications this is also used in, uh, this is a dashboard from one of our users who is using the device in a ship. And again, you can see that the principle is the same. You know, the whole construction of the dashboard is the same, but the user is able to set up the dashboard in the way they want uh, for a setup that might be suitable for a maritime a vessel application. The, the last dashboard I want to show in this playground uh, walkthrough here is just uh, an example of how uh, the, the dashboard concept can also be used. And, uh, and also I think how easy it is uh, with InfluxDB and Grafana to set this up. So again, this uh, GPS module that we mentioned before, uh, we have been you know, uh, developing this with uh, InfluxDB and Grafana as one of the tools in, um, in evaluating the performance and evaluating the functionality of this device here. So in order to do that, um, we have a run sort of a simple test where we are putting a CanEdge 2 uh, in the trunk of a car, at least a leaf over here. And then we're actually hooking up uh, two GPS modules in sync uh, right next to each other so that they should ideally uh, yield roughly equivalent data. The only sort of trick or, or, or sort of um, complexity to this is that on one device, we're using a functionality called sensor fusion. And that functionality is essentially able to use some of the information from the accelerometer and gyroscope in order to provide a GPS position, even when the vehicle is inside a GPS hostile area, such as a parking lot. And, uh, and I think this is an excellent demonstration of how, what you can do with Grafana and InfluxDB, because trying to visualize the effect of this in you know, other tools is practically impossible. Uh, trust me, I've tried. But, um, but if you check it out here, you can actually see the process. So on the left-hand side with the orange line, you're seeing the uh, GPS module where sensor fusion is not enabled. And then on the right-hand side, you're seeing the GPS module where this uh, sensor fusion uh, functionality is enabled. And what you can see is that they are equivalent here in the start as I'm driving out in the open, uh, on an open road. But as I'm moving into the parking lot here, you can see that the fix down in the lower left corner, which is essentially whether the device is able to catch the satellite signal, that drops. And for the orange line, it drops to zero, meaning it has absolutely no idea where it is. And as a result, you can see the orange uh, line, it just stops. But on the blue line, the fix type is one, uh, which means that it still has the functionality of sensor fusion it still knows the last position of the car. And from there, it's calculating based on the acceleration and the gyroscope data, where does it think the car is? So you can actually see the two, uh, two dots here. And the second one is actually moving uh, through the parking lot inside an area with no GPS signal. And it's actually uh, able to track the route uh, almost perfectly inside the parking lot. 
all the way to the end of it where both of them regain the signal. And this type of functionality is not only important when it comes to uh, the position uh, of a signal or the position of a vehicle, but also if you're using the GPS module for other data like speed, altitude, heading, roll, pitch, uh, and also odometer uh, distance. Without this functionality, these, uh, these values basically disappear, as you can see from the orange line. But with Sensefusion, you actually are able to continue having data on this in these areas. So this is just a good example of how it works and also a nice example of something else you can do if you have you know, a bit of a crowded dashboard. You can use these rows inside Grafana to, uh, to sort of collect your panels within different sections that you might think would be uh, related and you might think would be interesting to monitor at the same time. The, uh, the last thing I wanna show here on sort of the dashboard examples is just a bit about, you know, how have some of our users done this? And what always impresses me is when I talk to, uh, to our users, you know, the stuff that, <laughs> that they're able to do uh, is, is quite amazing. Uh, and therefore we try to keep these case studies on our website and you can go and check them out. We have around 40 uh, case studies and we try to filter them both, both based by category and title, but also based on these tags here. And one of the tags that you can find in here is telematics, have it here. If you click this, then it will filter uh, for all of the telematics use cases that are available in here. And it's just a really cool, I mean, we have some users that, uh, that deploy the CanH2, for example, in electric uh, transit buses, to collect data to their own cloud servers, and then they visualize the data in order to investigate the implementation of electric batteries. We have another use case here with a, uh, a defense vehicle, um, a small uh, sort of robotic vehicle or, or automated vehicle that is driving around here with a CanH2 on it. Uh, and when it gets within range of a Wi-Fi access point, then it will offload the data. And the data is then visualized uh, in a dashboard that the user has set up. And I think, what is cool about this is, I mean, we haven't uh, helped this user uh, set this up. They just do it themselves based on the guide. Um, and there are plenty of examples in here that you can check out uh, in terms of these dashboards. And, uh, and there are more down uh, if you scroll through them uh, in here. Uh, but I think that's probably sort of the best illustration for us that this is a nice concept is that the users are able to do it themselves. And in the presentation, we'll provide some links for some of the dashboards you've seen here. Uh, so you can check that out afterwards uh, and try the playgrounds yourselves. Um, then just a bit here uh, towards the end in terms of pros and cons on the implementation. Um, for us, I think it's important to, to uh, you know, say it like it is because there are, there are both good sides and bad sides to this, uh, this way of doing it. So I think on the good side, you know, it's easy to get started with this because of the, uh, the InfluxDB Cloud Starter um, option, as well as the Grafana uh, Cloud Starter option. That makes it really, really fast to get started. And also, if you have ever worked with Python, you'll find it very easy to, to run uh, the plug and play uh, script that we have for it, and you can test it out with the sample data. If you haven't uh, worked with Python at all, you might find a bit of learning curve just you know, installing Python and getting that to work, but nothing that can be handled within, you know, uh, so then uh, I think a nice thing about this is you can self-host everything if you, if you want, and then it would be 100% free and open source. You wouldn't pay anything. So you could use a self-hosted S3 server. You could use a self-hosted InfluxDB uh, database, and you could uh, self-host uh, Grafana as well. And you could uh, set everything up using Docker. So if you're familiar with that, great, you can do it. If you don't want to bother with that, or you want to have something that scales very easily, you can also just opt in for the cloud versions uh, of everything, which I think, again, makes it easy uh, for users to choose what they like uh, amongst these options. And then users can fully customize the front end in Grafana without having to be developers and without doing any scripted uh, part of it or any scripts involved in this. A downside is probably that you can say, if we were to create a more clean or elegant solution, that might be to visualize data directly from S3 uh, so that you could directly fetch the data that is already on S3 and visualize it. The challenge is, as I just, uh, described in the start, the data on your server uh, uploaded by the CanH2 will be in a raw form. It will be raw uh, CAN bus identifiers and raw data bytes. So you need some sort of mechanism to convert this into time series data. And you might be able to do this live, 
but it's difficult to get performance when doing this live. In particular, if you need to drill up and down across weeks of data at the same time as being able to go in and, and look at you know, one millisecond data, as might be relevant, for example, if you're analyzing acceleration data and other things. The, the other thing that can be a bit of a downside to this is that if you're doing periodic uploads through the CanH2, so let's say you have a CanH2 operating on a truck in the field uh, for three days and it's accumulating data, and then it gets back to the garage where there is a Wi-Fi access point. Great, it then starts uploading the data, but then suddenly your data processing script will have to crunch a lot of data at once. So it's not necessarily possible to, uh, you can say, flatten out this data processing exercise over time, which means that you need to think about this when you set up um, your solution for scale. Um, and then I think uh, another thing is, uh, when we started this, at least, the Flux support in Grafana was still semi-new, uh, but I think a lot has happened here in the most recent months in terms of making this, uh, this support more stable uh, and more full-fledged. I think that was pretty much it. Uh, also, just leaving time for if anybody has some questions on this. Um, so what we wanted to do with this webinar was primarily just to illustrate, you know, how have we used uh, InfluxDB and Grafana to create a solution uh, for dashboards. And I hope it, it inspires you to go and try it yourself using some of the sample data and trying to set up your own accounts uh, to, to get started with this. Great. Awesome. Thank you, Martin. That was fantastic. Um, so before we go into all the questions, I just want to remind everyone that we have Influx Days coming up in May. It's actually just in a few weeks. Uh, Martin did touch on the Flux language. So if you're interested in learning more, be sure to register for that training. All right, Martin, there's tons of questions here for you. Right. The first one is, Regarding the device, in addition to Wi-Fi connectivity for warehouse, could it offer LTE or 3G connectivity in case there is no Wi-Fi? Yes, um, the, the concept that we use for our devices is very much based on modularity. So the CanH2 in itself has the ability to connect to any Wi-Fi access point. That could be like a router in your office, uh, the router you have at home for your own Wi-Fi. You could put in the name of that Wi-Fi and the password, and the device would be able to connect through that. But if you are in a car and you want to upload data while on the road, so to speak, you may want to do so using a cellular hotspot instead of a fixed Wi-Fi access point. So what many of our users do is that they deploy the CanH2 with a small USB hotspot, like in this example here where the CanH2 is essentially powering the USB hotspot here, and then it connects to it via Wi-Fi. You could also just put the USB hotspot in your car's uh, USB power supply to have, you know, as if you were creating a Wi-Fi network in your car, and the CanH2 would, of course, also be able to connect. But this solution here is just useful in the case where you cannot rely on there being an available power supply in the car. So that's one way that, that some users do it. Others, they use different uh, cellular routers, but the CanEdge can essentially connect to any of them as long as it's a Wi-Fi router, so to speak. How about integration with NMEA 2000 data? Do you have a DBC file for that application? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. Uh, we're actually, uh, we have a guide. If you go to our website on the guide section, uh, you will see both our introduction guides to different protocols but also these application examples that you can see down here for different types of applications. So one of the applications we have with, is within the NMEA 2000 protocol, so for boats and ships and the like. And we are actually going to add a section very shortly on how do you create a DBC file within this area. So in very basic terms, uh, you can get the standard for NMEA 2000 from the NMEA organization. It's a very long and slightly cumbersome PDF, um, but we will provide a guide on how you can extract the data you need from this and create a DPC file. And this will probably be up within the coming week uh, and will be added in this article, but you can also contact us for, for getting the guide immediately. Could you also integrate with an existing SCADA system from, from a different vendor, for example, Siemens, or is there an integration required? 
uh, a specific, uh, what did you mention, Kate, in system? Uh, data? Data system from Siemens. Yeah. No, I don't think, um, we, we don't integrate specifically with, like, for example, proprietary data systems or specific data systems. So we, we have use cases involving Siemens where they are using our devices, but we do not have a specific integration, for example, with, uh, with Siemens products. Um, but again, you can integrate with pretty much anything. So here in the presentation, we went through how you integrate the data with InfluxDB and Grafana. We have other users that utilize our Python API to write data into a MySQL server or a MySQL database instead. You can do different things. Uh, so everything is possible. Uh, it's just a matter of whether you are able to do a bit of the work on your end on the integration. Correct. Is it possible to process compressed log files from Canage 2 with the Python API? That's a great question. It will be soon. It is, a, it is not a, a native feature in the API today, which I'm sad about because I think compression is basically a functionality on the Canage 2 that reduces the data size by 50 to 70%, which is really nice and, and should be used by everybody. The only reason not to use it right now is that our Python API does not natively uh, handle compressed files. And that is on our roadmap uh, and on our short-term roadmap. But um, you can do it now if you use our uh, converter tools and you can use those in a programmatic way, but it is a bit more cumbersome than if it was natively supported by our API. But for these things, I mean, definitely contact us and, uh, and let us know your thoughts on it. And, uh, and we will try to also push this in the coming weeks. Do you need an interpreter somewhere? Because CAN messages consist of CAN ID and, and end up up to eight bytes payload and InfluxDB cannot handle binary data. That is exactly correct. So the dashboard writer script, as we call it on our GitHub page, it essentially uses different API modules that we have for, for processing our CAN data. So what happens in this API or as part of this API script here is essentially that it takes the raw canvas data and it turns it into decoded data. The way it does this is essentially shown in this very basic or high level script so it essentially initializes the connection to your influx database. You specify what time period you want to get data from. Then you create a link to your file system, for example, your S3 server to be able to get the raw data. Then you put in the path to your DPC files and the DPC files are these magic keys, so to speak, if you're not familiar with them, but that tell you how to go from binary or from raw canvas data into something useful and into time series data. And then you, uh, you load your log files. And what happens here is essentially that you extract the raw data from the log files into a pandas data frame. And this pandas data frame is then processed by our API tool here in order to create a new pandas data frame, which now contains time series data. So for example, RPM and speed in kilometers per hour and the like. And these time series are then simply written into InfluxDB using this uh, last part here and using some of these classes we have. So I can't go in depth in, in this session here, uh, but that's the gist of how it works. And you can find all of our API modules, of course, on GitHub in here. Which port of the car or jack is used to connect the CAN Edge to? Which version of CAN 11 bit? So if the question is how you would connect it to your car, was that the question or? I think so, yes. Yeah. Uh, which port of the car would you use as well? Yeah, it depends a bit. I mean, if you, let's say you're a family dad who wants to monitor how his kids start driving around in the car, then the typical way you would connect would be through the OBD2 port. Uh, so if you search near your steering wheel, just left to it, typically a bit down, you will find a, an OBD2 connector that matches this adapter here. And you can plug this into your car through this connector and then the other end into the CANH2 so that essentially you connect it to this first port here. And then you use a configuration where you request data from the car and that's how you get things like vehicle speed, fuel level, fuel consumption and the like. If you are an engineer at let's say Volkswagen, 
as in one of our case studies, you might want to get some data through the OBD2 connector, but you might also want to get some data through other means, like from some of the raw canvas data. Because as an OEM, you typically know how to interpret both the OBD2 data, but also the raw uh, proprietary canvas data. And in such a case, you might want to use one of the channels of the CAN edge to lock through this OBD2 cable. And the other channel you might use with a CAN crocodile, as we call them, to, to lock data from the raw CAN bus wiring harness. So without going too much in depth on this, you can see on our products page, a lot of the typical adapter cables you use, whether it's for recording data from cars like this one, from trucks like this one, from industrial and boats like this one, or from more generic applications like these two cables here. For customers in mining or other verticals where some additional decoding is necessary, is there something you can do to help with or is there another path you would suggest? We have CAT and SANVIC trucks, scoops, and drills. Yeah, so, so this is a common question that, that I get a lot. Um, so one of, the, uh, one of the things to understand when it comes to CANBUS data is that recording the raw CANBUS data is simple enough. You can do that from pretty much any of the applications we went through. Decoding that data requires that you know how to interpret the data. In some cases, you know how to interpret it. Uh, for example, the, the case of a, of a car, like a, any regular car, typically you can decode OBD2 data because it is standardized and it's public how you do it. The same goes for many heavy duty vehicles. Uh, if you use a J1939, a DPC file, then in, in, in my experience, probably across 70% of heavy duty vehicles, you can extract probably 60 to 80% of the data from them using the standard DPC file, whereas the rest of it will be proprietary. When it comes to mining vehicles like Caterpillar vehicles, uh, then you may face that some of the data will be possible to decode using a J1939 DPC file, whereas some of it will be proprietary. And there is no, to my knowledge at least, there is no public database where you can find out whether a specific vehicle is supported or not. So what we recommend is that users, they essentially try out a recording data from the different vehicles for use case with a single device. And then we offer that they can send the data to us to check whether it can be decoded using the J1939 DPC file. If that's not possible, then pretty much the only other way is to reverse engineer the data, which is hard, or to get a deal with the OEM, which is hard if it's Caterpillar, but feasible in some other cases. Uh, let's see, someone is saying, we have a thousand trucks to monitor. Is it possible to use your hardware plus InfluxDB and Grafana? Yeah, I mean, it is possible. Um, and you can use the, the CanH2 as we discussed in here. And you can always contact us to, to learn what type of combination of, let's say, cables and different accessories would be relevant. What I would say is that when you look at this, you should always look at whether this is the right solution and, and what you're trying to do. And I would say for these type of use cases, when it comes to bigger volumes, what we recommend is to step one, contact us to understand whether it's a good fit. Uh, and we try to answer very, very fast on this. And step two is, if you think that it could be a good fit, then we recommend to try it out uh, and do a proof of concept with one unit uh, very early on. So, so I have seen a lot of cases where these bigger volume projects, they stall because no proof of concept is done. And you very late in the process figure out whether it's feasible or not at all. Uh, so we try to encourage doing that very early on. Right. Is there an existing GPS tracker with RS485 or RS232 interfaces? Can we connect the CAN edge? If yes, any specific manufacturers supported? There, there, are, many, uh, there are many GPS modules uh, and also GPS to CAN bus modules on the market. Uh, so the one that we are coming with is the one we recommend because it is designed using the same design principles as our CAN edge. And it is uh, possible to power this module through a five volt power supply, which means that you can use it on the second board of the CAN edge in a very simple setup as shown here, for example. Um, but you don't have to use this one. And we have customers that use other, uh, other GPS modules. Um, 
if you have a specific module in mind that you are considering, we always recommend to just send us a link for it and we can verify whether it is compatible or not. But as a general rule of thumb, you know, if it produces GPS data via CAN bus, then our device will be compatible. So as long as it's producing CAN bus data, the CAN H2 is a CAN bus data logger and it will record it. Um, so, so if it's CAN bus interfaces, then it's fine. Why did you opt for InfluxDB Cloud versus um, some of the other offerings, the other yeah. versions? We, uh, I originally looked at some of the uh, the options. For example, in uh, in Grafana, they have some built-in uh, data sources such as Graphite and and other uh, databases that could also be used. Um, and you you could use uh, other time series databases. But take the example of the uh, building Graphite in Grafana. One of the limitations here was that once the data would be more than a week old, it would basically be downsampled. So the max resolution would be one second. But after one week, it would be 10 second resolution. And that's not always very useful. So if you take, for example, the, the data in here, uh, data like our acceleration data from, from this module here, you might want to go down to very, very detailed levels uh, of resolution, uh, intra-second resolution, in order to monitor how this data is moving um, in order to, for example, look at road bumps or other things. If the data is aggregated to 10 second resolution, then for many CAN bus use cases, it's useless. So, so that was one of the things that we look for uh, with InfluxDB, where the default retention is 30 days and the data is not downsampled within that period, which was important for us. And why, did, why were you specifically interested in the uh, cloud version of InfluxDB? Yeah, the reason for that was that, I mean, if you're familiar with Docker and other tools like that, you might find, you know, self-hosted, it's very easy. Why not just do that? If you never used Docker before, uh, then, you know, self-hosting a database, self-hosting a dashboard tool, then it becomes a bit much uh, for many people. The cool thing about the InfluxDB cloud is that we can provide a step-by-step -step guide that always works, regardless of whether a user is, you know, in one country or the other. They can go in and they can add a new data source and the data they need to input is generic. It's standard and it's standard the way you would find it within the InfluxDB cloud interface. And that is what allows us to provide, you know, a step-by-step -step guide where we can provide a small video like this one so that every user will have the same experience. Without this, then uh, we would basically be bogged down in support on setting up Docker and other stuff and, and it would not be possible for us to do this concept. Um, so I think, Caitlin, you also mentioned time to awesome, which is important for InfluxDB. And, and that is the key for us. We need to make it possible for users to see a proof of concept of their own custom dashboard within half an hour. If they use that half an hour to fail setting up Docker, then it's not going to be a very cool proof of concept that they can show their manager. And therefore, the project may fail. But if they can get past this first part, then they can always shift to a self-hosted solution down the road if need be. Um, or they might decide to, to use the pay cloud, whatever is, is most suitable for their project. So, so that was the key motivation. Fantastic. So I know we have gone completely over. I'm just going to have a couple more, uh, go through a couple more questions. And then if anyone has more questions for Martin, please feel free to email me and I'm happy to connect you with him. And there were a few people that asked if this was being recorded. Yes, the session has been recorded and the recording and the slides will be made available later today. Uh, okay, so a couple more questions. Did you implement Telegraph as a data collector with Python or do you have Python pushing data directly to InfluxDB through posts? We, uh, the way that the Python script works is that it takes the data from the log files, extracts the physical value data, and then it pushes that data into InfluxDB. So if you want to get you know, a bit more of a, an idea of how it works in, in detail, what I would recommend is to check out the dashboard writer script or the uh, repository here. And specifically, you can look at the utils uh, DB uh, class in here, where you can see the logic of how we set up the influx part of this. And specifically, there is this section regarding how we write signals. 
And essentially what happens here is just that we, we provide a pandas data frame with a time series, and then we write that into a influx uh, DB. So you can see the process of how that works here. But no, we don't use Telegraph uh, for, for this. Uh, let's see, are the log files created by the CanEdge devices with actual time and date rather than system time? Yeah, the way it works is the CanEdge 2 has a small real-time clock inside that, uh, and, and a battery backup that allows it to know what the date and time is at any point in time with a 0 0.05 millisecond accuracy. That, that date and time information is then added for each and every single CAN frame in the raw data and it is then carried through to the decoded data. So you will know that the vehicle speed was 55.5 kilometers per hour at you know, March 14th down to the uh, microsecond level. So that, that, is, uh, that is something that the CanEdge 2 timestamps uh, as part of the, the device itself, if that answers the question. <laughs> Perfect, thank you, Martin. Thank you everyone for attending today's webinar. I apologize that we weren't able to get through everyone's questions. I know there were a lot. So once again, if you have any uh, burning questions that you would still like uh, Martin to answer, please feel free to email me and I'm happy to connect you with him. Once again, thank you everyone for joining today's webinar. Really appreciate it. Um, and this session, once again, has been recorded and will be available for replay later today. Thanks. Thank you.